Oh, bless his holy name. Let us stand together. Let us stand together. Bless his holy name. A wonderful change, a wonderful change that the Lord Jesus Christ brings into our lives when we surrender to him. And I would strongly encourage you today, if you've never surrendered to him as your personal Savior, do it today, and he will bring a wonderful change over your life. If you've done it in the past and maybe you've drifted away from him, just re-surrender to him today, and he will bring a wonderful change in your life. And even over the difficult places, the hard presses, the hard times, the Lord will comfort and he will encourage you. He will sustain you and energize you and constantly remind you that you belong to him. Amen? Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. If you turn with me in your, in your Bibles to the sixth chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, and we continue this morning our verse-by-verse -verse study of this marvelous, marvelous New Testament book, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, or the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. And this is an incredibly important book to the church because it links the life and the ministry, the death and burial of Jesus. It shows us what happened after his death and what did his followers do after his departure. And so it is the only... Uh, authorized history of the early church that God himself authorized by inspiring the beloved physician, Dr. Luke, to write uh, this record of the book of the church in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 6, I want to pick up with verse 1 and read through uh, and including uh, verse 8. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplying, there arose a murmuring of the Grecian against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason or good that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. May God's rich blessing be to his word and may it be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word, for it speaks to our souls, our spirits, and our minds, and it illumines us, and it feeds us. The Lord, take your word and feed us again this morning. Satisfy the longings of our souls and our spirits and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I want to talk about what have they put up on the screen. <laughs> so what they put up on the screen is what I'm going to talk about. The first potential blow up of the church. That's what I want to talk about. <laughs> that's what I want to talk about. The first potential blow up of the church is what I want to talk about since they put it up on the screen. I had the pleasure to uh, meet with a gentleman I've just got to know through uh, Dr. John Perkins, and he has one of the fastest growing churches in, in America. Uh, the church was established in 2003, and they currently have 7,500 members. And the growth has been so rapid, they haven't been able to build a build, they still meet in a school. And uh, Brother Tony Gordon and I got the pleasure of meeting and speaking with this gentleman on uh, this past uh, Thursday, I believe, and it's actually the church that our dear uh, Tammy Toller and her husband attends, uh, New Birth Charlotte in, in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Just a great young guy, humble and a powerful preacher and just, just really blessed of the Lord. And as we were talking, he basically said, he says, Pastor, I just got 75 messes. That's what I got, 7,500 messes. The growth has been so, so fast, and we haven't able to put a structure in place to accommodate all the people coming. He says, as a matter of fact, the past several weeks, I haven't even asked anybody to join the church, hoping that nobody else will come, simply because we're trying to put things in place to minister effectively uh, to the people. 
The church exists. It exists for the glory of God, ultimately. But it exists on earth also to minister to the people of God. And the people of God, they have problems. And so the more people you have, the more problems you have. And it's sort of like an oxymoron. You know, if you have a lot of people, you got a lot of problems. But if you have a lot of people, you also have the potential to solve a lot of problems. All the problems of the church is created by the people. But all the solutions for the problems is supplied by the people. That's just the way God has designed it. God brings people that hurt, people that are broken, people that are going through a multitude of things in their lives, and God also brings people that have been hurt, that have gone through a multitude of things in their lives, and God uses those people to provide ministry and to provide encouragement for those who are hurting. People create all the problems, and people are also the tools in the hand of God that solve the problems, that God uses to solve the problems with pe that people have in the church. We see this in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 6. The church is having exponential growth just several months after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And some of the Bible commentators estimate that they probably had at least 35 to 40,000 people that were now of this newfound church. They still don't have a bound New Testament Bible. They have no constitution, no organizational chart. They're just trying to minister to the people the word of God and pray and encourage the people. And since many of the people had come to Jerusalem for the feast of Pentecost, and there they had responded to the gospel and received Jesus Christ, and so many of them did not return to their homes in other cities and even in other countries. And so now the church has this added burden of how we're going to meet the needs of all these people that don't have the means to take care of themselves. They don't have jobs. They, they don't have stable housing. Their lives are not stable here in Jerusalem. And so we saw in Acts chapter 4 that many who had means uh, they were liquidating their assets, bringing the cash, giving it to the apostles so they could meet the, the immediate pressing needs of the people. And I believe that this early history of the church, the apostles did not have a full revelation of what it really meant to be the church. And they had no idea how long they would have to sustain this effort. I believe that they thought that Jesus would be back in a short period of time and that they would be able to preach the gospel and that once people heard them preach and retell the story about Jesus, and once they realized that they, he was the Messiah that they had rejected, that many would believe and accept Christ, and basically the whole nation of Israel, for the most part, would be converted, and then Christ could return and establish the earthly kingdom that had been promised to the nation. They operated under this premise, and so God is never obligated to tell us everything. And God never gives us a full and complete revelation of that which he's going to do. God gives us enough to stir our faith, and then we respond to him by faith, and then God gives us more. For the just shall live by, by faith. And so if we knew the beginning from the end, all the particulars and all the specifics, then we would not be walking by faith. We'd be walking by knowledge, by insight, and by wisdom. But we're to live the Christian life by faith. So they were walking by faith. And so now they have this whole bunch of folk and they're trying to minister to the people and they're trying to work through the issues and God just continues to keep adding to the people. And so sometimes success, it creates it all its own problems with it. Just ask the fellow down in Putnam County that hit the lottery. As a matter of fact, they did a study of uh, many of the people that hit the lottery, and many of those people's lives just kind of spin out of control because the money and the attention, it took them in a level that they really weren't ready to deal with. Their lives changed so dramatically and so profoundly in their wildest dreams, they never thought they'd be dealing with the issues they got to deal with that a lot of money brings, you see. And we see the same thing happen with a lot of these young athletes and a lot of these young entertainers. My heart is kind of grieved. I, I, I find no joy. It hurts me when I see this stuff on television about Britney Spears. A beautiful young woman, tremendously talented, gifted by God. And now everybody talk about what she need to do. She need to repent. I mean, somebody need to tell her she need the Lord. That's probably the only thing that can kept, keep her life from spinning out of control to where she just totally self-destruct. 
all of the attention, all of the money, all the accolades, the big stage at a, such a young, tender age where the maturity is not there to handle it. Success brings its own problems. And so be careful what you pray for. We only want what God wants us to have because that's probably all we can manage and not destroy our lives. So even in the church, too much success, too fast. If the church doesn't have the spiritual maturity to handle it, can create its own problems as it does here in Acts chapter 6. So the first thing I see here in Acts chapter 6 as we talk about the first potential blow up of the church was the problem with rapid growth. The problem with rapid growth, it says, in those days when the number of disciples were multiplied, they were not having linear growth. I mean, they were having geometric growth. There were hundreds coming at one time. In one, two occasions, several thousand responded to the gospel invitation. So they're bringing all of these newborn Christians into the faith with all of their baggage and with all of their religious tradition that they thought was consistent with the word of God, but in many cases, it wasn't. And a lot of the stuff that we have inherited that's been handed down to us are things we need to unlearn because it's not consistent with the Bible and we keep on trying to stack it on top of the scriptures so we can't really grow because this stuff is in the way of God really speaking to us. So now they got this, all of these people coming, this geometric growth, this rapid growth, and with rapid growth or with a little bit of growth or with no growth, there's one thing that will happen that if people are not engaged, if they're not involved, if they're not working, then it becomes a lot easier for them to find something to murmur about. Those who engage and those who are working, they know how difficult the struggle is. They know how hard things are. They know how much effort has been put in to trying to make things work. But those who are not, it's easier for them to analyze, to be, to be spiritual spectators, to critique, and to evaluate and to find something that doesn't measure up to their standard. Even those who are being ministered to, as in the case of this text. So the people that were doing the complaining were the people that were being ministered to. There arose a murmuring, a complaining among the Grecians against the Hebrews because the widows were neglected in the daily serving of food of the ministration. Now what you gotta understand is we gotta really understand that the, 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 the early church Though all of these people had a Jewish heritage, they did not all have the exact same culture, you see. Judaism, by this time, is not a monolithic, homogeneous quilt. No, many of these people lived in other countries, and so they had adopted some of the culture from these other countries, even though they still held the basic tenets of Judaism. So when it says the Grecians, they referred to as the Hellenist, and they spoke Greek. They hadn't lived in Jerusalem. Many of them hadn't even been born in Jerusalem. And so the spoken tongue by the masses under the Roman Empire was not Latin, it was Greek. That was carried over from the days of Alexander the Great when he had the world empire. Greek was the spoken language of the masses. Latin was the written language of Jewish prudence and of the government, but Greek was the spoken language. They didn't even speak Hebrew. They spoke Greek. Now, the Jews who were from Israel they didn't speak Hebrew. <laughs> By this time, they spoke Aramaic. Now, most of them knew Hebrew and could read Hebrew because the Old Testament text was written in Hebrew, but the language that they spoke, for the most part, was Aramaic. So now you've got Greeks that speak Aramaic. You've got Greeks that speak Greek. I mean, Jews that speak Greek. Jews that speak Aramaic, Jews that speak Greek. So now language becomes a barrier. Language becomes a barrier because they don't speak the same tongue. And so now even interpretation of what is meant can mean that there can be great, great misunderstanding. Are you following me? So the Greek-speaking Jews, the Greek-speaking widows, the Hellenists, they felt like they were being slighted every day when they were serving the meals. And the widows got a priority at the meal table because the Old Testament taught and the New Testament would carry over that the people of God had a responsibility to take care of the widows. So now they're being served every day. But they feel like when they're being served, they're not getting the right portion. Their food isn't coming fast enough. And they're looking at the Aramaic 
speaking Jewish widows, and the peers, they're getting larger portions, they're getting better service, so they start complaining, we're not being served enough, we're not being served fast enough, and we're not getting the same treatment as the Aramaic-speaking Jews are getting. Are you following me? So this becomes a major problem when you've got probably several hundred or maybe even several thousand widows that's a part of this whole situation. You get several, several thousand people complaining about any one thing, it creates a problem. So that's the problem that threatens to be the potentially the first blow up in the church because it will split the church along this line of the Greek speakers, the Aramaic speakers, and you could have ended up at the first Baptist church of the Greek speaking Jews and the second Baptist church of the Aramaic speaking Jews. It could have happened. The church could have been split right here on this issue right here. It was so volatile. And it was so emotional, and it was so intense. And so there comes the attention of the apostles. And in dealing with this, what the apostles do is that they try to help the people understand that the ministry has to have some priorities established. So verse 2, it says, Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Not that serving tables is a demeaning job. Not that it's not important, but the apostles were saying we have a unique responsibility. We're trying to figure out what we got to teach the church without a New Testament and trying to pray to remember what Jesus taught us. And as we started the Old Testament text to try to understand what are the applications for the Old Testament that was for us now that was fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. And so they say we have to establish some priorities. If we got 35,000 folks, somebody can serve the table. It's what they were saying, and it's not going to be us. They say it's not good for us to leave the minister of the word to come to referee as to what size of cornbread somebody going to get. And what if somebody get two scoops of mashed potatoes or one? They say it's not good, so we've got to maintain a priority of what we have to focus most of our attention on, and we have to create a system to delegate this other work that is important because people need to be fed. And if we're going to serve on a daily basis, there has to be a system whereby that is done, and there has to be buy-in from those doing the serving and those who are being served. Are you following me? So they established the priority, first of all, to be the minister of the word, then there will be the serving of tables. The third thing I see is that they were able to derive the proper solution to the problem. Verse 3, what they do is they involve the folk who got the complaint, who make the complaint. There they become a part of the solution to the problem. And in the context of the church, you really shouldn't voice a complaint unless you prepare to at least articulate a solution. At least what do you think? is a possible way of fixing what you've analyzed as being broken. If you've taken the time to analyze it, to point out why it's broken, then at the same time, you should be looking at, well, how could this be made better? So what the apostles do, they bring the people together, and they say, Wherefore, look, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. If you think you've been treated, un 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 treated unfairly, you think we're showing partiality because all the apostles they spoke Hebrew and Aramaic, so they didn't speak Greek. They could speak Hebrew, they spoke Aramaic, they could read Hebrew. So they say to the people, they say, well, you choose people that you trust. You select people that you really think they have the integrity to do the right thing. All we suggest is that they have some minimum qualifications. And the minimum qualification is that they're full of the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit, as evidenced by the way they live, the way they conduct themselves, their hunger for the Word of God, their willingness to study the Word of God, and that they also already have a good report or a good reputation among the rest of the congregation. And they have wisdom. Now, you don't, it doesn't take wisdom to serve tables, does it? Yes, it does. It takes wisdom to serve tables when you stack up into a problem where people have been complaining about they not being treated fairly, so it takes wisdom to understand the environment that you're ministering in to try to do all that you can possibly do to relieve any, any concerns that people might have that you're not going to treat them fairly. Are you following me? And anytime you're dealing with people 
and someone is going to have a position where they have some authority, they need to be someone that's really spiritual. It amazes me how the church wants to put people because they have demonstrated uh, ability in some secular area. That's not transferable to the church. It's not. It's not really transferable. Are they spiritual? Are they really spiritual? Do they have the mind of Christ? Are they committed to their own spiritual growth? Do they show evidence of being committed to spiritual growth? Because I tell you, it doesn't matter how fair they are and how diligent they might try to be in doing service. Somebody's still going to misinterpret what they do and what they say, and they're still going to get criticized by the people they serve. And can I get an amen in the house? And do they have the spiritual maturity to be able to handle that? and to deal with it and understand that really is simply one of the occupational hazards of being in a position where you have some authority and some leadership. There's always going to be people who will look at what you're doing, and they might be right. You see, they might could do it better, and they might would do it differently. And when they get their chance, they can do it better, and they can do it differently. But when you're doing it, you've got to do it the way you think it needs to be done. So you got to have people that are full of the Holy Spirit and can deal with the ambiguity and they can deal with the tension and they can deal with the pressure that even when I do my best, as consistent as I know how to be, and as much as I know my own heart and mind, I'm trying to be fair and just and equitable, everybody still's not going to be, still isn't going to be satisfied with that. But do you have people that have the spiritual maturity that they can keep serving anyway? Keep serving and not be bitter and not be mad and not be hating and not retaliate, but just keep on serving and in due time see if God through the Holy Spirit can turn people's hearts. So that's why they said, no, we need to put spiritual people in this because we know they're stepping into a hornet's nest. And they're going to have to deal with detangling some things that they don't even know the full scope of what they're getting involved in, but with the Spirit of God and wisdom the ability to assess and analyze a situation, look at the possible options, and then through prayer, select the option that's of the best benefit to the most amount of people. So, the proper solution, involve the people. Secondly, enlist godly support. And make sure they have demonstrated, that they have demonstrated spirituality, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom so that you can give yourself to that which has a greater priority than what many of the people will ever fully understand. There are some things that the people will never fully understand or appreciate the priority that a leader has to give to certain things that he or she is called to do. Now watch what they say. Verse 4, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the apostles had to decide what is the priority that we should give our time to What really should have our focus and our concentration that we give ourselves to that the majority, if not all of the people will benefit from, and that it's essential to the body growing and being built up and becoming strong in the Lord, and that is the ministry of prayer, and that is the ministry of the word. And the weakest ministry in the church is always the ministry of prayer. And I have to confess, the weakest part of my own spiritual life is probably my prayer life. And I'm repenting and starting over almost every day. That's why part of my ritual, I ain't trying to make nobody feel guilty, but I wake up early, so I decide I might as well get up. And so I get up and I walk every morning, 5.30, 5.15, and it's the time I can pray. Ain't nobody else up in the neighborhood, and definitely nobody else up in my house. And so the opportunity just to pray and to call up up the Lord and call out people's name for the Lord as the Holy Spirit brings people to my mind, I can pray for them because I know once I get here, it's like being on roller skates. The minister of word and prayer. And I just encourage you to pray, to pray for me. If you want to pray for me in one area, pray that the Lord will strengthen me and I'll be more disciplined in my prayer life and that I'll be more disciplined in my study life. There are things that you're gifted to do, and people think it's easy because you do it every week. 
But it's not necessarily easy because you do it every week. It doesn't get any easier if you don't spend time praying and spend time studying and spend time trying to understand the word of God and not saying somebody else, somebody else didn't say it, but trying to figure out what is it God wants me to say or what is it God wants to say through me to this congregation of people who have left the comfort and convenience of their home to come to hear if God has something to say. So for me, the ministry of the word is very, very important. It's very important. And that's why we're trying to get this church anchored back into the ministry of the Word of God and get people back to looking at what the Bible says, not what somebody says the Bible says, but what does the Bible really say and what is God saying to us from his Word in 2007 and what commitment is God calling us as the Grace Bible Church to make to him as he reveals himself through the Word. So the apostles really understood that and their job probably was the hardest job that any spiritual leaders have ever had because we have the benefit of a bound New Testament text, the canon, the entire Bible that God wanted us to have. But what they had was an experience of three and a half with Jesus, pieces of Old Testament scrolls put together, and they're crying out to the Lord, Lord, help us remember what you taught us because we didn't write nothing down. And so now they're trusting God to bring to their remembrance the things that Jesus had taught them so they would be accurate in their communication of the principles upon which they were calling this new body of believers to commit themselves. Are you following? That's why you really need to be in discipleship class. I know y'all smarter than me, and you probably all got high IQs higher than mine, and you can know more of the Bible than what I know. But you still need to be in the discipleship class. You never get to the point to where it's just your Bible and you. And that's where some Christians get. And that's my concern for this church, the Grace Bible Church. We have the vestiges of spiritual arrogance because we've had this historical citadel a built on solid Bible doctrine. We came out of a Bible church and we've had trained Bible preachers and with that becomes arrogance. It's where we think we know something that we don't really know. And we're not doing what we do know. And it's not the hearers of the word, but the doers that are justified before God. Help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. We gotta let God speak to us anew and afresh not what he spoke to us about five or ten years ago, but what is God speaking to us today? Where is he calling us today? What is the challenge that God has placed upon our lives individually and corporate as a body today? And we only hear the voice of God through the word of God. As the spirit of God takes it and illumines our hearts and our minds, and as we meditate upon it and we really sense the Lord pressing upon us, in a way that convinces us this is the the voice of God to us. Are you following me? There's still spiritual voices. You you gotta listen to somebody. And so there's still voices. John Perkins has been speaking into my life for 27 years, and there are spiritual voices that I still listen to because I need to have someone speaking into my ear, into my heart and my mind, and have the confidence to believe that God is using them to speak to me. So they have the proper solution. And because they involve the people, and the people now have ownership in the, to the, of the problem, and they have ownership for the solution, now there is alignment once again in the ministry. Verse 5, the power of our solution results in the multitude being pleased. People say, this is fair. This is reasonable. This makes sense. If we have the, we don't think that we've been treated fairly, we got the opportunity to choose people we think would treat us fairly, and the qualifications that you have given to us are not overly burdensome, they're not uh, exaggerated, this is a fair solution. And so what do they do? They do exactly what we would do. They chose people, they throw show favoritism toward them. That's exactly what they did. They were no spiritual than what we are. What did they do? Verse 5, and the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicor, and Taman, and Parmeas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. You know what they did? Everybody they chose had a Greek name. All those are Greek names. 
Him out they chose were fellow Greek-speaking Jews. And they chose folk that they thought would show favoritism toward them. But because the apostles had laid out the credentials, they had enough confidence to believe that even though they think they're going to get preferential treatment, we believe these men are going to do the right thing because they're full of the Holy Spirit and they're full of faith. And they know we're trying to advance the church, not trying to divide it. Are you following me? So these guys could reinforce that. They could say, okay, now we're going to start our own congregation. And we're going to speak Greek, and they won't know what we're talking about half the time. No, they were committed, and they understood what the charge was, and they understood the severity of this issue and how the church could blow up and be splintered and divided over the servant of the tables, and so they had the right men. The multitude was pleased. And then the Bible goes on to say, verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and they made a big deal over this. They prayed about it, and they laid their hands on them, which was a symbol of the transference of authority and a call for the blessing of God and for the anointing of God. It was an Old Testament rite that was carried over into the New Testament when people are being set aside. The spiritual leadership calls them apart, prays for them, and places their hands upon them in agreement that the power of God and the anointing of God will be on their lives and the blessings of God, and God would give them the wisdom that they needed to discharge the ministry that they were being set apart to. Are you following me? Well, let me wrap this up because we still got the Lord's table to observe. The multitude was pleased, and the text went on to say in verse 7, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples Multitude multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. It multiplied greatly. Now they have an even more exponential growth because this, that which threatened to cause a blow up in the church was resolved and now the Holy Spirit can continue his work because there's enough unity there and enough togetherness that God continued to add to their number. Thus, God giving confirmation that he's pleased with their decision. And not only that, God went one step further. God then broke over into the ranks of the Jewish leadership, the Sanhedrin, and some of the priests, those who had been arch enemies of Jesus of Nazareth, those who had been a part of the clandestine conspiracy to have him arrested on trumped up charges and to force Pilate and to crucify him. God invaded their ranks and even saved some of the priests. And what do you think that did for the faith of the church? Those early believers seeing the power of God unleashed in their midst and seeing these arch enemies of Christ come to know Christ and then come and join in their little humble congregation to step down off of the precipice of their royal rule and reign as a priest and as being those who everybody else kowtowed and bowed to and to become just one in the number of those who are following Jesus of Nazareth. But one last thing happened here that we will look at for the next several weeks. When he says, and, great company, and a great company of the priests we're beating to the faith. See, there are little things in the Bible that we can just kind of walk over. We don't really see how profoundly significant it is. A great company of the hundreds of priests, it doesn't say how many, but it was a significant number of them who turned and yielded and bowed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And had they got hung up over the food, and kept fussing and arguing and complaining about how much food a certain person would get. This never would have happened. Because people would have been repulsed by the church. They said, we can argue all by ourselves. We can fight by ourselves. Well, last thing, the other thing I see here is that a spiritual star was born. A man by the name of Stephen. It's in a crisis. And I've heard Dr. Perkins say it on a number of occasions, and every time he says it, it's still even more profound to me. The leadership normally emerges when there's a crisis. The problem with this country is that we really don't have the type of leadership that we need. 
we have too many political wannabes and too many politicians. And so no one steps in the midst of a crisis and says we're going to do what's right, not what's expedient for the short term, but let's really do what's right. And let's see if God will bless us because we do what's right. What leadership is all about, leadership is about seeing the plight of the people. It's about seeing the pathology. It's about seeing the burden and the pain of the people and starting to feel the pain of the people, feel the burden of the people, feel the pathology of the people, and then to cry out to God that God would give vision to articulate, to relieve some of the pain of the people. That's what leadership does. We've created, in this country, we created this group of people that are superstars and we reward people because they are gifted intellectually or gifted athletically, not because they serve somebody. And so we're always ready to give somebody a war or give somebody a plaque because they have done something that they were gifted to do, not because they serve. So the true servants, they go unrecognized and unnoticed. And so our children don't realize that Jesus was right when he said the greatest among us was those that served. Those that served. And so what happens when the things are bad, when the situation seems out of control, what leadership does, leadership says we are responsible. We have some responsibility to jump right up here in the midst of all of this craziness and have enough faith to believe that God will move and he will move because we are there in his name to represent him. And that's what we'll see about the early church. They were always on the cutting edge of what was happening in their society. They were always in the midst of stuff because they believed that God could work in the midst of all of the mess and the confusion that existed in their land. So in this, a star is born, a man by the name of Stephen. And he steps up to the plate just to serve tables. He stepped into the plate to be a servant, to be a waiter, and to be a busboy because that's what the church needed for him to do. And with all of his giftedness, which we will see next week, and with all of his skill and all of his ability, he never was in no way jockeying for position, asking to be added as the 13th apostle. He just simply said, if you need me to serve the tables, I will serve the tables. God had already qualified him and credentialed him to do something much more significant than that. I wish y'all would pray with me. Some of y'all are spiritual geniuses, but you just don't know it. And so you're sitting around waiting for a lightning bolt from heaven, waiting for God to write up in the sky what he wants you to do. And all God wants you to do is jump right in there and do what needs to be done. And once you do that, you start moving. God will then propel you and elevate you in a place that he has designed you for before the foundation of the world. you got to believe that, that God knew you before the foundation of the world and God stitched you in your mother's womb and God caused you to gestate there for nine months, then he brought you in this world and you weren't aborted prematurely by your mother through a miscarriage, but he brought you into this world. He's allowed you to experience certain experiences and go through certain things and learn certain things. All of that is just a prerequisite to service and then God brings you to the precipice where he's going to launch you to do something great and significant. Oh, I wish y'all would realize what God really wants to do. I, I wish y'all realized what God really wants y'all to do and what God wants us to do. If we just want to serve the, serve the Lord. You know, I, I, don't, I share this with you very reluctantly because y'all, some of y'all will misunderstand it. Some of y'all misunderstand what I want to get to say. I have people calling me from all over the country want to talk to me and ask me questions. I don't even know how they found out who I was except through John Perkins. This guy down in Charlotte called us and asked we'd come down and spend two hours with him. We rolled down. He wanted to talk to us about some ideas he heard that we had. See, I'm satisfied with that. I don't need to pass the 7,000 folk. I don't even need 700. I like to have a little more than 70, but hey, if all I get is 70, I got to do something with that group. That's a large enough army. To take on something, Jesus had 12. But what I'm trying to get you to see is that God is positioning us to have an impact in his kingdom. And whatever I do, y'all go with me because whatever I know, I've learned it from working with you here. And if we just do what God tells us to do, we will impact the kingdom of God. I wish I could tell it all. 
This whole community is getting ready to change. 211 acres from our, our, our street to Patrick Street, all the way down almost to uh, Florida, down Florida, down Second, over the Central, across to Washington, 211 acres. That the Charles and Urban Renewal Authority is getting ready to develop, and we just found out about it by accident. And now all of a sudden, everybody wants to know, what do y'all think need to be done? And so behind the scenes, we're just submitting ideas. We think there should be a home ownership zone. Low-income indigenous people ought to be to buy their own house. So people come and giving us property over half a million dollars that we can develop and control in this neighborhood. God is getting ready to do something I'm trying to tell you. He's going to do something really big, really large, in a place, in time, that we can give him the glory. I'm reluctant to talk about it. Very reluctant to talk about it because it's not about me, but God has chosen to bless faithfulness over a period of time of other folk. And every time I get up and step out, I think about Al Perry, who sacrificed himself just to help me. And Ed Edmonds, who sacrificed, and they believed in my ideas more than I did, and made sacrifices people never would know that they made just so I would have an opportunity to stand up and say what I wanted to say. God is at work. He's at work, and some of you young people got to realize it. You got to really understand that you're a part of something great and part of something significant to be a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't miss the opportunity to be trained and to be developed because you never know when God wants to propel you to do something great and significant. And people may never even know that you were a part of it. That's irrelevant. God knows. That's all that matters. God knows. God knows. God knows. So we don't ever despise a humble beginning. We never despise a humble beginning. Jesus Christ of Nazareth was born in a manger, in a stall. He was wrapped in rags. And he was the savior of the world. And he died on the cross in shame and humiliation. He was raised from the dead. And he's coming back in power and with great pageantry, and he's coming back as a royal king. If we just serve him, that's all. If we just find some place to serve him, just find some place to serve him, give somebody a cold glass of water in his name, just find some place to serve him. Help the tenants with Child Evangelism Fellowship. They can establish good news clubs in all these schools in Kanoa County. They just don't have enough people willing to help them do it. Just serve him. Tell somebody about Jesus. Pastor Tyler has Kant Blanche access to all the schools, not only in Kanoa County, but most of Southern West Virginia. For the child, I mean, for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, the huddle groups that's read right in the schools where kids lead prayer meetings and Bible studies every single week. Just serve him. Just serve him. Find somewhere to serve where you can talk about Christ and build a relationship to talk about Christ. And I tell you what, God will add people to the kingdom. Oh, yes, he will. Oh, oh, yeah, he'll do it. He'll do it. If we're just willing to serve him, as we will see in the next couple of weeks as we look at Philip and Stephen, who started off serving tables and became two of the most powerful men in the early church. And Stephen himself, his life, the first martyr, the first blood that was shed for the cause of Christ by a human being. Is the blood that caused the church to get out of Jerusalem and to become a world religion. That's how God can work. That's how he works. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for all that you're doing for your own glory and for the furtherance of your own kingdom. And we thank you, Lord, for this great privilege that we have to serve you. We thank you, Lord, how you called us to work together and pray together and cry together and agonize together, but to be blessed together, to see your kingdom furthered together. And we thank you for the privilege. Lord, if there's one of the sound of my voice that they've never come to that point to where they surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, turn from their own way and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me. I pray that maybe today they might make their choice. In Jesus' name.
Every head bowed, every eye closed. You're here this morning. You've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior. God loves you. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. His blood was shed for you. He was buried and raised from the dead for you. And if you would just turn away from your own way of thinking and own way of doing things and turn toward God and say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I cannot change myself. But I believe that you love me. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I put my faith, I put my trust in the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me. If you pray that simple prayer, the Lord will hear you cry. He will honor it. He will honor it. And it's a choir has already sung to us so beautifully. A wonderful change will come over you. A wonderful change will come over you. He will take away the guilt and the shame that you might be living with because of past sins and indiscretions. A wonderful change. Is there one here today you just want to be saved? So just raise your hand right where you are. Let someone come and talk with you and pray with you. Encourage you from God's word. You just want to be saved. The doors of the church are open, the invitation is extended. Just pray that simple prayer. Ask the Lord to come into your life and to save you today. Is there one? Is there one? You just want to be saved. You just want to be saved. Is there one? Don't let this moment pass by. Now is the day. This is the time. If you sense a need to, to get right with God, if you have a desire to, to be forgiven, now is the time.